Thank you, Jim. Good morning, everyone. I hope the meeting so far has been uh, enlightening for you, and hopefully I can add to that. Um, before I get started with my presentation, I have several questions. For those of you that have CRPS RSD, how many of you are anxious about going to the dentist due to your diagnosis? Okay. Have I don't, and I do. Have any of you gone to the dentist for treatment and then have had um, increased symptoms of your CRPS? Okay. Um, how many of your dentists have significant knowledge of CRPS? All right, that's what I thought. And how many of you would like, um, well, next question is pretty obvious, okay, is would like to go to a dentist who could avail themselves of someone trained like me who could help them treat you with your diagnosis. So I think that's pretty obvious. Okay, so let's see here. All right. Um, I've been doing this since 1981, and uh, that's why I have shoulder injuries, okay, myself. I have a lot of chronic pain. I've had multiple back surgeries and bilateral shoulder surgery, so I empathize with what you're going through. So if you need to contact me after this meeting, ask me questions. It's Dr. Epstein at ddsny.com. Um, this is an encrypted email, so when I respond to you on my email, it will all be encrypted and your knowledge or your history will be safe. So my background, um, I've been working with pa patients with special needs actually before I became a dentist. This was my drive in life. And um, I do this as in all of these areas. As a program director at Stony Brook, I have 12 residents who I'm responsible for, so we're trying to treat the, teach them how to treat patients like yourselves. In my private practice in Great Neck in the greater New York, Long Island area, and uh, we'll go on from here. So what I plan to do today in 30 minutes is uh, talk about state regulations for dentists and they're very specific to each state because this is going to affect who can really provide care for you and give medications like ketamine during your treatment if, if such medication is uh, desired. Uh, ketamine techniques administered by dentist anesthesiologist. Uh, important considerations for patients like yourselves just for dental care by itself or um, with sedation. Um, and then I've left a good amount of time for questions in case you have any. So here we go, state regulations. There are 50 different regulations, okay? Every state has, their re has a different regulation pertaining to dentists who can administer uh, agents that are considered sedative agents or general anesthetic agents, whether they're considered dissociative agents also, such as people classify ketamine. So a dentist graduating from dental school cannot administer ketamine. Okay, just so you know that. There are some states that require a certificate to administer nitrous oxide. There are other states that don't require a certificate. Um, a few years ago, both medicine and dentistry decided to use the same terminology. So now we use minimal sedation. They used to be called anxiolysis, just so you understand. Now, New York State, for instance, does not have any regulations for minimal sedation. Many other states do. Moderate sedation, that used to be called conscious sedation, and that includes dissociative agents like ketamine, and then there are some states will say, if you're using ketamine, that requires a certificate for deep sedation or general anesthesia. Okay, so uh, things are very specific to the state where you are. So, you know, I covered this about what medications dentists can administer. Is ketamine specifically mentioned in s some state regulations? And it is in some states. In New York State, 
we just look at the level of sedation you are going to be in when drugs are administered. So if you're administering certain drugs, you're going to be in a state of moderate sedation, then you could, okay, that would qualify, all right? In certain states, once again, if you administer propofol, propofol can be administered as a sedative agent, but there are some states that say if you administer propofol, you need a certificate for deep sedation general anesthesia. Okay, and the bottom line in blue is very important. Dentists cannot treat CRPS RSD, but they can treat patients with that, with CRPS. So you can't go and ask your dentist for an IV infusion of ketamine, okay? But I can administer ketamine as part of my anesthetic. And personally, I administer ketamine for many different reasons. I administer it almost every day that I'm in practice, okay? And just to enlighten you, um, uh, children, with, uh, children or adults with special needs um, that, are that create uh, behavioral issues that we can't treat in a dental chair without, they can get an injection of intramuscular ketamine, okay? And usually we use ad adjunctive medications with that, like uh, midazolam or dexmedetomidine. So there are other drugs that we use. I use it for patients that are on uh, narcotic programs, withdrawal programs. I don't want to administer narcotics, so I will administer ketamine, okay, with other drugs as part of an anesthetic. It may be for sedation, it may be as an intubated general anesthetic, for a fractured mandible, for treatment of multiple decayed teeth. All right, so for many dentists, or for dentist anesthesiologists, ketamine is not foreign. It's used almost every day in their practice. Okay, so to talk about te uh, techniques that we use, there's low-dose ketamine, typically administered with adjuncts, midazolam, propofol, dexmedetomidine, narcotics. Now, have any of you heard of dexmedetomidine before? Okay, have you heard of clonidine? Okay, more people have heard of clonidine. Clonidine and dexmedetomidine are in the same class. They're alpha-2 agonists. All right, the idea about using dexmedetomidine, it has a 1600 to one selectivity for the alpha-2 agonist compared to clonidine. And it's a, not a brand new drug, but it's a drug that many people are becoming more and more familiar with. And we administer that with narcotics, sometimes very short-acting narcotics, and other time long-acting narcotics. And um, I don't know if there's a pointer here, but you see the picture on the side, that's a, an infusion pump, all right? And that's the way we will administer many of these drugs. It's a small computer, we enter in the weight, and this way we can administer the drug per kilogram or microgram per kilogram per minute or per hour. Um, Besides using it in a pump, we can use intermittent IV push. So there are many times um, uh, where we will administer just a push of, say, 30 milligrams of ketamine. I know some of you are very knowledgeable, knowledgeable about your medications or about the infusions, and you may have an idea about dosage. That's why I'm mentioning it. So for, you know, we're using it for an anesthetic. Okay, once again, not for treatment of CRPS. So at times we will administer higher doses. Um, and we can use multiple infusion pumps if we're infusing ketamine, dexmedetomidine, or other drugs. Okay, this is a little bit about alpha-2 agonists, specifically uh, Presidex, dexmedetomidine with ketamine and how it works you know, on the alpha-2 receptor and decreases norepinephrine release. 
So it helps with the sympathetic control of adrenergic receptor pharmacology, how it decreases the norepinephrine release. Okay, and it acts as both an analgesic, a sedative agent. Okay, so it can be very advantageous. Okay, now important considerations, whether you're having uh, anesthesia for your dental care or just sitting in a dental office, and this is what we found. The most important thing is pain-free dentistry. So local anesthesia can be extremely helpful, okay, and whether it's administered through infiltration or block anesthesia. Block anesthesia, you're um, providing anesthesia to the tr trunk of the nerve, and it's a more profound anesthetic. Those of you that have had an injections in the lower arch and you feel your tongue and your lip, the whole side of your face, that's usually due to a block anesthetic. Um, and the anesthesia has to be profound during the anesthetic and also for the perioperative, the post-operative -oper period. Um, for some patients, they'll require intravenous sedation because the local anesthesia um, does not reach the level that's necessary or due to anxiety and stress, being worried that the local anesthesia is not going to work or just being very afraid of dentistry. And then the, uh, the deep level of deep sedation, general anesthesia, whether that patient is intubated or not intubated. And all this can be done in a private office and definitely can be done in a hospital. The problem that we have is insurance coverage, which I'm sure is, you know, there are going to be a lot of questions or some questions afterwards. All right, so I'll leave that to the end. Supporting neck and limbs. This is something, you know, that I find is extremely important, whether we're using bolsters, gel supports, blankets, or pillows. And here we have a patient, and this is a picture we just took in my office on Thursday. So you can see uh, the picture on the left. Is there a pointer or? I don't know. The picture on the left, you can see how. I'm good at wrecking things. Let's see how well I do. Jim, you may, may not invite me back. Okay, well anyway, the picture on the left, you can see how the rest is just limp, okay? This patient is completely asleep. It's a general anesthetic, the patient's intubated. And that's very poor, where you have that ligament stretching, this can end up causing problems. And this is um, also in, in the OR, you know, it's one of my responsibilities as the anesthesiologist to make sure that the limbs are well supported. And you can see the picture on the right, that limb, that wrist is now supported. We have it lying on the patient's leg. And also the elbow, okay, is being supported by a cushion. Okay, um, this is the same patient. Patient is intubated. This is just a head wrap to protect the head. The, it's a pillowcase. All right, but you can see the cushion underneath the head. That's a gel support. All right, you may think a dental chair is, is soft, and, but if a patient has their heel, for example, on the dental chair uh, for two or three hours, all right, when they wake up and you look at the heel, it's all white or red, you know, just due to the pressure. So it's important to have here on the head, we have, that's called a donut. And the picture in the right, you can see that we're providing neck support by an additional gel support. Okay, and uh, this is one of my residents. But you can see in the lower left, these are different types of gel supports. Uh, the two on the right are, um, in that lower left-hand picture, the two in the, um, on the right side are donuts. Those are, you know, one pediatric, the other adult. The one lower left, is uh, heel support, and then you have neck supports or arm supports. The one in the middle and the lower is um, a neck support, very soft, 
and the one on the right is um, a knee support. All right, so I have a very bad back. I know, where, you know whether I have physical therapy. You know, I'm in a dental office. I ask for something to be put underneath my legs. All right, and you can see this is uh, my resident, you know, volunteering and showing how all of these are used. Okay, once again, a close-up, a different knee support. You know, in dental chairs these days, the new chairs, they look like they're space age, but, you know, many of them don't provide the support that you need. So here in the right picture, you can see one of those neck supports we're using, you know, as an arm support. And you don't have to use these gel supports. You can use blankets. You can bring a pillow in yourself. You know, you should make sure that you're comfortable if the dentist doesn't provide it, doesn't have it, then bring it in yourself. Uh, ventilation and temperature control. Here I'm talking about like these air vents. We've all been in meetings where it's blowing very hard and down on you and you get cold air coming down on one side of your face or arm and that can be, um, can initiate some pain, prolonged pr uh, pain issues. Uh, blankets, a bear hugger is a, a device we use in the operating room that provides uh, warm air and um, on the top, on the bottom levels, you see the air conditioning and you can see that's, that's floss, by the way, coming down from the air vent. And you can see on the left picture that floss is being blown, you know, towards one side of the room. So we use it to just to make sure that the AC is on, we can actually see. But you can, you know, if you have a very strong system, once again, it's coming down on the patient, this can be an issue. On the top three pictures is the bear hugger. Um, the one in the middle just is uh, showing what it is. On the left, um, it's actually, uh, what happens is warm air is blown into it. So it's extremely light, so you don't have a lot of weight on the patient. And it can keep the patient nice and warm. Uh, those of you that have had surgery, you wake up very cold. You know, it's, a, you know, it's, it's not a good thing. All right, so this way we can keep the patients warm. You know, they wake up, as I say, toasty. All right, so it works out very well. Um, this is one of the last pictures, positioning of the chair. I mean, if dentists, we like to work with patients sitting back. It helps our backs, okay, over years of treating patients. But if you can't be in that supine or what we call a semi-fowler's position with the head slightly up, then let the dentist know that you need to be in a sitting up position or you need to be in a more supine system, all right? Um, one of the reasons that we provide sedation or anesthesia for patients is that some of the procedures are prolonged and to be awake sitting in one position, okay, you know, can cause issues. So this way, if someone is sedated, we can make sure that the limbs are supported they are warm and we can provide care, you know, in fewer visits, all right, and hopefully that works out for the patients. And we can be providing medications that are muscle relaxants also, all right, so that your muscles aren't strained during being in one position for a long time. And the other thing is for, you know, collaboration with um, your pain doctors. Okay, or you're treating you for CRPS. It's one thing about our healthcare system is we're very separated and it's important that we're all involved together in the treatment to make sure you get the best care possible. And, okay, so. We have a moment, a couple questions. Um, just let me get uh, the mic to you. First, I'd like to thank Dr. Epstein. Thank you. Does it have to be in the back? <laughs> Where do we go about finding a doctor like you? Like for somebody who lives here in Illinois? Um, since we're in Illinois, I've, several, people have, um, several people have come up to me and asked, and I will get that information. You can 
email me directly or I can get it to Jim if you could give me someone in Illinois who may be able to get that information out so that they have it you know in case a month from now two months from now a year from now someone needs it our warrior Gracie okay okay Gracie wait for this oh, I got Uh, excuse me. Uh, quick question: Do you use ketamine as a as a drug administered for for dental surgery? Uh, is it something you can request from a physician from a uh, from a dentist here in Illinois as a routine? Well, I, most dentists that are trained like me, you know, use ketamine on a regular basis, on a daily basis. So I don't think they would have any objection using it. All right, it's. You know, we're meeting across the hall determining doses and things like that. Um, you know, the question that's going to be is how much would someone like yourself or the person we're talking about require during the anesthetic? That wouldn't be the sole medication, the only medication provided. You may get propofol, you may get midazolam, other drugs, you know, for the treatment. Like I said, we're not treating the CRPS. So it's one thing is if we have an oral surgeon extracting one tooth and it's going to be 20 minutes, um, the, the ketamine is going to last here and the procedure is going to be this length of time. So ketamine this length of time, treatment this length of time. So you know, we, we'd like to try and match up you know, the anesthetic time period with the surgical time period. Um, if the surgeon is putting it, say, placing six implants, you know, and there may be a restorative dentist doing a restorative part, you may be talking about a four-hour procedure, there's no real issue in giving higher levels of ketamine. That just really has to be worked out. There are some people that are, let's say, going for ketamine infusions, all right? So in that case, what I would probably do is speak to that person and find out what he advises the amount of ketamine to be administered during that procedure. He may say 80 milligrams, 125 milligrams. I'm just throwing out numbers now. Okay, that's not an issue for us because we're trained as anesthesiologists. Okay, but we have to see, is that gonna be distorting the surgical time period? And if it is, to decide how we're going to do with that issue. Because if it is, well, let's treat you in the hospital, the problem we have is, how are you going to get insurance coverage for the hospital for that procedure? It's going to be very difficult or impossible. And the costs for you are going to be extremely high. So it's that whole social economic situation that I think we all have to be sensitive to in treating the patient. Dr. Epstein, last question? Uh, I think you're really great, but I hate going to the dentist. <laughs> and now that I have CRPS, I really get a lot of anxiety about that even more. I mean, one little slip in my mouth, just for regular cleaning, could be disastrous for people like us. So my question isn't so much about these deep procedures and surgeries and things like that, but what about cleaning? Just a regular cleaning. I worry about that. Is that something that you use just a really, really light amount of ketamine for? Just in the event that your hygienist or whomever might slip with that poker and make me bleed? The question is, is if I administered, let's say, 20 milligrams of ketamine, okay, we're not even sure that 20 milligrams is going to do, be beneficial at all. I can, I can administer that. The question is, you know, do you really need a minimum dose of, say, 80 milligrams well, I'm not for really it to talking be effective? About, I'm not talking about dosing. What I'm talking about is, do you do it for cleanings? Do you have to it, use it for cleaning? I, I've never used it just for, let me put it down. Okay, I had a patient th this past week, okay, who's a, a gagger, okay, comes in once a year. We put him to sleep. To manage his airway, we use something called an LMA, if any of you know what that is. And for that, I can administer ketamine. 
Okay. If you're talking about someone just coming in for the, say, what a hygienist would do and just use ketamine for that? that? That's what I'm talking about, because we like to be as proactive and precautionary as possible. Um, I can't say I haven't done that. I haven't had the issue of doing that. I haven't said no, okay? I haven't done that. No one's ever asked me to do that. All right, the question is, is I could do it. See, I have a stationary, well, I practice different ways. I go to other people's offices and I practice in my own office. So I could do that in my own office. That would not be a big issue. If I had to go to a dentist's office for a half hour procedure, it's almost not affordable for someone. You're not gonna find people out there they're going to be able to do that. You know, I'm trying to be very practical yep. as what people are going to be doing on the outside. Sure. Uh, what you said and what I heard was pretend to gag. Just Excuse so you know. me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am an oral surgeon in Chicago, downtown in the Loop, and I work with trigeminal neuralgia, fibromyalgia, uh, people with dental phobias, autistic kids, and uh, we can do a lot in the offices where insurance, medical insurance won't cover. Uh, there are certain surgeons throughout the Chicagoland area that will provide in a safe environment, because we do generals all the time, doing implants, extractions. Uh, people with facial swellings, abscesses, people that have been auto accidents and, and or, or bike accidents, falling, trauma, mugs, you know, muggings and all those things. That's routine in, in an oral surgery practice. So if you're in a situation where a f your f pain physician would like you to get an infusion of ketamine before you're going to the dental hygienist for deep scaling and curatage or periodontal office, I'm sure that a lot of the oral surgeons can help you in that situation and make it much more economical uh, because it's true. The way the de uh, medical insurance is changing rapidly, that it might be the best option for you in a controlled environment with less cost. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you.